Hello and welcome to the Straits Times panel discussion on COVID-19. Is the circuit breaker working? I'm Salma Khalik, Senior Health Correspondent at the Straits Times. A fortnight ago, on April 7, Singapore started four weeks of circuit breaker measures. These include closing down all non-essential businesses, getting people to stay home, and if they do need to go out, to wear masks and to stay a safe distance away from others. The hope is to break the chain of COVID-19 transmissions in the community. We are just halfway through that, but yesterday, the Prime Minister announced that it will be extended for another month. This special edition of The Big Story looks at the impact of the circuit breaker so far and why it needs to be longer than just four weeks. Let me introduce you to the panel of experts with us today. Professor Liu Yisin, Executive Director of the National Centre for Infectious Diseases, which has treated more COVID-19 patients than any other institution in Singapore. Professor Teo Yek Ying, Dean of the NUS Sorcery Hawk School of Public Health. Prof Teo is an epidemiologist, or someone who studies trends in diseases affecting public health. Professor Dale Fisher, a senior infectious diseases expert at the National University Hospital. Prof Fisher was part of a joint mission by the World Health Organization and China to study the COVID-19 situation in Wuhan in January. Now, before we look at whether the measures so far have worked, let's do a quick recap of new things we have learned about the disease since January, when Singapore saw its first COVID-19 case. And have any of these led to changes in the way we fight the outbreak? For example, at the start of the outbreak, the, out the advice was for only people who are unwell to wear a mask. Now there is a $300 fine for anyone going around without a mask. Why the change? Prof Teo, would you like to lead off? So let us take a look at the policies around masks. In January and February, there was a very strong message to the public that you should not be wearing masks unnecessarily unless you are not feeling well. And that message seemed to have, there seemed to be this new turn by the government with regards to its policy around masks. So a couple of weeks ago, the country changed its stance around masks and now there is a very strong messaging that mask is required. So this, this are some of the, the timeline of events. And I really want to make three points. The first point is that our knowledge about the transmission of the SARS, uh, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the coronavirus that we're dealing with, it has changed since the end of January up to this point. Because back in January and February, the knowledge that we have at that time is that it is unlikely to be asymptomatic. So that was what we understand. I think a point that we need to emphasize is that our knowledge about the coronavirus is changing all the time. And as countries start to learn more, our policies need to change accordingly. Secondly, Singapore right now is fundamentally at a different phase of the outbreak right now compared to when we were in end January and early February. The third point is that there is a need to protect national stocks and international stocks of personal protective equipment for the healthcare workers. That is one of the, the fundamental objectives that hasn't changed throughout. One point I would like to make is that if masks were really so important in preventing transmission and infection, we would have seen the situation in Singapore got a lot worse in February. Based on the situation right now, it is prudent, it is necessary to protect ourselves with masks. But really, if masks had such a big impact, we would have seen the situation in Singapore got a lot worse in February. So essentially, you are saying that masks are not that important and yet it's still important for us to wear them. Uh, that seems to be a little bit of confusion there. Perhaps, uh, Prof Leo, maybe you could talk about whether you think it's necessary and uh, to wear a mask today? Well, I, I think, first of all, I would like to uh, agree with uh, Yi Ying that uh, indeed uh, the knowledge has uh, increased. Uh, we learned a little bit more about uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, that, uh, uh, that caused the COVID-19. And uh, I think it is also very important to bring in these notions that our preventive measure needs to be flexible uh, to the knowledge that we gain uh, along the way. 
Now, I also want to emphasize that uh, at this point in time, there are many studies in the past looking at influenza viruses and looking at other respiratory viruses. There always have been these debates about the usefulness of masks. Uh, but don't, don't forget that uh, having a mask on carries a very different behavioral connotations and meanings as well, that it constantly reminds us that we are in a very unusual period of time. Uh, and, and I hope that that kind of a notion will also help us to be able to fully understand the importance in terms of social responsibility. Uh, in addition to masks, uh, I certainly hope that you know, in, in terms of the uh, society, we can beef up uh, our social responsibility in terms of cough and uh, sneeze etiquettes. And even in a normal time, uh, if we do have uh, developed of respiratory symptoms, it's always good to put on a mask. I think it is for personal protection as well as uh, protecting the society. And it's exactly what we need from the entire society and community today to be together to fight COVID-19. So essentially you're saying that it's not just the protection the mask gives us against the virus, but also the fact that wearing a mask makes us behave differently socially because uh, it makes us aware that there is an infection out there. So it serves two different purposes. Right, I still want to add on that uh, mask is not one and the only thing in terms of uh, preventing the spread of the virus. Mm -hmm. Do remember there are many other steps that we emphasized before and remember to keep them not just during the COVID-19 period, but it should be part of our daily routine. Right, so these are washing hands, safe distancing, things like that. Uh, exactly. Are there other things that uh, new information has come up that has made us change the way we are tackling this whole thing? Since we are on the topic of masks, perhaps I will just quickly add on a few things that uh, Prof Tio had also briefly mentioned. Uh, on the mode of transmissions and on the behavior of the virus. So today we know that there's such things called pre-symptomatic transmissions. We also know today that there are asymptomatic infections. And not only that, um, we also learned from many other studies as well as the local experience that the virus shedding is much higher during the early onset of illness and not only that, there are also evidence suggesting that the persons can be very transmissible even before they start the symptoms. And it can be two to three days even before symptoms appear. So in other words, individuals can be completely normal looking and don't feel any illness and yet can be infected and can infect others. So I think all these are new knowledge that we gain along the way that we need to constantly reminding ourselves in terms of policy and in terms of prevention strategies we need to keep up to the knowledge. Right. Prof Fisher, is there anything you would like to add about new knowledge and how we should change the way we have been fighting COVID-19? Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Selma. I, I agree with, uh, with Yi Sin and YY uh, about the masks. I think, uh, I think it's not so, so much about filtering the air that you're inhaling, I, I think, and I think that's where people feel very secure about it. I think it's about modifying behavior. I think it's uh, it's a constant reminder to to be careful and to do all those things that, that we uh, feel strongly about, like the social distancing, not going out unless you have to, uh, hand washing. So, so I think um, masks have a role, but in actually filtering air, uh, I, I'm not sure it's uh, it's doing uh, anything, especially if you are social distancing. Um, because this this virus doesn't just float along the street. It, it's uh, it, you really do need to be close to somebody, or or else touching a, a contaminated surface. Um, right. uh, other things that we've learned, uh, I guess I'm learning that this virus is 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 really smart. Um, it, it can find our blind spots. It can find vulnerable people. It can find areas where there's high transmission. It seems to you know, d despite our efforts, you know, it's still leaking into the nursing homes. Luckily, you know, we're we're jumping on top of it very quickly, but, you know, we've got very aggressive efforts in the nursing homes and, and it still finds its way in. It, it found the dormitories um, and and is causing our biggest problem there. So, so, you know, my message to Singapore and the world is just, just keep a lookout for for vulnerable places, whether it's through transmission or through severe disease. A smart virus sounds pretty scary. 
Um, are we on top of the virus when it comes to treatment? Has there been new things that have come up that makes treating patients easier today? Uh, either Prof. Fisher or Prof. Liu, would either of you like to touch on that? Well, perhaps I will go first um, to give a little bit of uh, not so good news. I think as of now, um, it is quite clear that we have not been able to find any of the antivirus that shows efficacy uh, in clinical treatment. The uh, very much talk about the remsidovir trial, uh, at this point, we are still sitting tight, uh, waiting for the verdicts uh, to be out. Um, and um, we do not know at this point in time whether or not it will cause any significant uh, treatment uh, benefit. So we do need to look into many other ways, whether you know using the uh, uh, immune uh, therapies or using uh, other forms such as uh, convalescent plasma to be able to complement uh, uh, complement supportive treatment uh, in, in in our patients. How about at NUH, Dale? Has uh, treatment changed at all? No, it's uh, our efforts are really about. Um, you know, identifying patient, patients that may turn from mild to more severe. Um, but no, Yisin is exactly right. Um, care is, remains supportive uh, and it's more the reason why we need to, to, to really push hard on containment and keeping the numbers down. That, that's easily our best defence and it always was. I believe Israel has recently said that they have got a treatment that provides 100% success. Have you people heard of that? Uh, uh, it was in yesterday's papers, but I believe the numbers were also very small, but the US is trying it out as well. I think you're going to hear a lot of these, um, Salma. Uh, we heard it with hydroxychloroquine. Uh, people are so desperate to find a treatment. Uh, I think they're quite appropriately saying, uh, I, I found something. Uh, but but you really have to read between the lines. Um, you know, good, someone's got something sort of uh, reassuring that might give us some confidence. Um, but, but you know, these, these trials really need to be much bigger than, in this case, seven cases. And also, we'd really be looking for something that's, that's scalable, um, you know, like a, a, a tablet, uh, something that could prevent clusters would be good. Um, I would love a tablet that we could... Uh, drop in all the unaffected dorm workers now to, to prevent them getting it. Um, but, but you know, e every day we're going to learn of, of new evidence, but, but the, the game-changing uh, standard of the evidence is, is still a way off. Right. Can we now turn to look at the cases we have in Singapore? Prof. Teo, although the total numbers are high, if we look only at the cases in the community, the number has been coming down. So has the circuit breaker actually been working? And why is there a need to extend it? So if we look at the data affecting the community, it is indeed true that we see that the numbers from before the circuit breaker up until yesterday, the numbers in the community actually dropped. And we see this very clearly when in the beginning of the circuit breaker, the three day average was around 48 and yesterday, uh, the past three days, it was around five. So based on those numbers, we know that the circuit breaker is effective. But is it giving us the, the effect, outcome that we are hoping for at this stage, about 15, 16 days post implementation of the circuit breaker? That is the part that I am actually a, a bit disappointed that the numbers have not fallen as low as we were expecting. And this really points to the presence of some leakages that's happening in the community, whether it is amongst people who are supposed to be staying home, but yet they have been venturing out without taking the necessary precautions, or it could be some of the essential workers that are still out there working and they are the ones getting infected. And we have seen in over the past four days evidence that suggests that some of the workers in the essential sectors are getting infected and this is the reason why there is a need to perhaps step up the the circuit breaker measures to now limit the the definition of what is essential services and to further restrict uh, the, uh, the essential sectors a, a bit more right uh 
I can understand greater restrictions, but then there is no restriction on people exercising without masks. And you notice along the East Coast, etc., you get crowds of people running, jogging, walking. Is that uh, a place where the virus could leak? At the moment, based on some of the information that I've seen, there is no clear evidence to suggest that it is at East Coast Park that people are at exercise, whether it is in parks or whether it is in your neighborhood gardens that people are getting the infection from. Right now, the majority of the trends for, for the infections outside the community still points to workplaces and perhaps some household trans transmission. There are still some unlinked cases that we don't know about, and this is really the reason why there is a greater degree of restriction now on some of the park connectors, on some of the beaches as well. So we really have to understand where the unlinked cases are coming from and then to put in place the necessary measures to really try to drive this down. Right. Now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are only two weeks into the current phase of the circuit breakers. And incubation generally is five to seven days, or it could be longer. So the people who are uh, coming up as new cases now could have been infected prior to the uh, circuit breaker, except maybe for the last two days. So then the question is, was the Prime Minister jumping the gun? Could he not have waited maybe another week, or would it not have made a difference? Uh, Yisin, maybe you could take that? Well, I, I think um, I, I will approach it uh, in, in this way. Uh, in, in many ways, I, I do agree with uh, YY's point in terms of the uh, the disappointment we have at this point in time. We have not seen a, a, a satisfactory drop uh, in the uh, local transmissions. Um, but if you were to look at the entire world, uh, Singapore is not a unique uh, example that we have imposed a circuit breaker. Uh, China obviously has done so, and many other parts of the world. And if you were to look at the, uh, the, the degree of decline of the number of cases, you then realize that two weeks is not a period that will be adequately able to reduce the number of cases. And uh, then you look around that many of the other countries that had imposed uh, lockdown of the cities or the entire countries are now extending the uh, period of, uh, of lockdown. And, and it's important for us to understand as the reason why. Uh, the reason why is basically this is a very smart virus, like what uh, Dale had just mentioned. It will find ways to remain in the human populations and try to find a way that it can transmit and continue to stay with us. So it's not something, it's a simple virus for us to deal with. It has human to human transmissions. It can transmit when we are not aware and uh, I, I do agree that at this point in time, uh, two weeks definitely not enough. Uh, how long should we extend? I think it is better for us to use this period to inculcate into us the behavior. Because if we don't change our behavior, it's no longer how long your circuit breaker is going to be. Because once we bounce back into our own normal self, the virus is going to come back. So I think, I think those are the important things we just have to bear in mind. Right, thank you. Prof Fisher, could I turn to you? Uh, you know, the very large number of foreign workers infected, the spread in the dormitories uh, for the last one, I mean, I'm sorry, let me uh, run that by again. Uh, the spread in the dormitories was noticed in March, at the end of last month. So we began our uh, work with the dormitories more than a month ago, almost a month ago. So why are the numbers still so high? There's a, there's a lot of catching up to do, uh, Salma. The, 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 this is a very complex uh, situation. It's not uh, people turning up to the emergency department and, and having a swab. It's, uh, it's you know, hundreds of thousands of, of men. Um, uh, we have to establish, you know, strategies uh, on, on how to minimise the transmission. Um, for instance, you know, do you put your efforts into the very affected dorms, or do you put them into the slightly affected dorms? There's there, there's questions like that, and and how how uh, thin do you spread uh, uh, across, you know, what is 43 dorms, and and about uh, they're the uh, they're the purpose-built dorms and the factory converted dorms. There's over a thousand of those as well, so uh, it, it's cutting across efforts from 
Ministry of Health, Ministry of Manpower, the Army, the police force. Um, it's uh, if you're asking people to to stay in their rooms until uh, transmissions uh, decrease significantly, you've got to get food to them. You've got to get uh, get uh, get Wi-Fi. You've got to get uh, capacity for for medical services at the dormitories. So. So, you know, people haven't been sitting on their hands. There's been a, a lot to put in place. Um, you're going to see the numbers high for, for many weeks to come. Uh, and that's more of a reflection on our, on our efforts, uh, I think, rather than, uh, you know, than the lack of effort, if you like. It's uh, finding the cases is good. Uh, pulling them out into a community isolation facility is important, but but actually they're the most overwhelmed at the moment and they're, they're being constructed uh, as we speak uh, because we, we want to get uh, positive cases you know, out of the dormitory. There's also efforts to, to pull out the, the older dorm workers, uh, the essential dorm workers. So, so as you can see, it, you know, it, 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 it is very complicated, but it's, uh, but it's getting the attention it needs. So what you are saying essentially is that the numbers are way too large to manage easily. Although some of the workers have been rehoused, I think about 10,000, we are talking about 300,000, more than 300,000 living in dormitories. So there is still not very much uh, social isolation within the dormitories and you, that's why you expect it to spread. Is that uh, essentially what you are saying? So dormitories aren't uh, one body, right? So there's for instance, at, at Sungai Tanga, there's there's ten blocks uh, and there's ten floors uh, and there's uh, perhaps twenty rooms on each uh, on each floor. Now, if, if we can uh, encourage the men to stay on their level, stay in their dorm uh, as much as possible. If they come outside, please don't touch anything. Please stay a meter from other people if you're walking up to use the bathroom. Uh, we, we can prevent transmission. Uh, within the dorms, uh, but it's challenging. Uh, but you know, if obviously, if if you're not exposed to anyone except you know your your 12 uh, fellow room room members, uh, if none of those have got it, then as this blows over, then those 12 men didn't get it, for instance. So, so th this is the the ambition uh, and 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 part of the strategy. So. You're saying that uh, you expect the numbers among foreign workers to go up for the next few weeks. Prof. Liu, do you agree with that assessment? And does that <clears throat> then mean that uh, the social isolation at the moment is really not working because we can't isolate them enough? Uh, yes, uh, I think Prof. Liu. Over, here we have, over here we have to look at the, the mathematics of this. Uh, Dale has given a a very clear illustration of what the, the government has done for the migrant workers. Right now, what we know about the coronavirus is that for every infected person, it can go on to infect another two to three people if there were no measures taken. In a community like the, the in a tightly dense community like in the dormitory it can actually go up to infect between five to ten people more. So this is a very infectious virus that we're dealing with. Now, why am I talking about this infectiousness? Because if there were no measures taken, right now, if you are seeing between 1,000 to 2,000 cases that are being reported every day, in about four or five days' time, we will see potentially 4,000, 5,000 cases in another four or five days' time, we will be looking at 8,000 to 10,000. That is the reality that we are looking at. We need to drive down the infectivity of the virus. And we drive this down by the measures that uh, Dale has mentioned, really trying our very best to increase physical distancing in the dormitories. Short of putting all of our 200, 300,000 foreign workers in single room as much as possible, otherwise, we are looking at perhaps an infectivity that one person will go on to infect another 0.8 or another one person. Let me use a, a simple illustration. Let's suppose we are able to take very successful measures where 
every person that is infected now only has the chance to infect another 0.5. What this means is that right now we are seeing 2,000 cases. In another four to five days time, this will go down to about 1,000 cases. In another four to five days time, it will go down to 500. So it will take time for these measures to keep halving the number of infected people. So that is why we, from our model estimates, we think that even with the best measures that we can put in, we are still looking at perhaps three to four weeks to contain the situation at the dormitory successfully. You know, some people have suggested that there are actually two different uh, outbreaks in Singapore, one in the community and one in the dormitories. At the moment, the dormitory one is the one that's exploding with very high numbers. So the question is, although it may not be very politically correct, can the dormitory uh, measures be tightened and the rest of the country be eased? Is that possible and will that work? Uh, Prof Fisher, would you like to take that? Uh, they, they, are, they are two outbreaks. They're, they're, they've got separate strategies. They've got separate uh, epidemic curves. Uh, so, so that's a harsh reality. Um, but they are still linked. Um, you know, so, so much of Singapore relies on the on the on the foreign workers. So, so there's a lot of services that you couldn't open up anyway, simply because because you don't have those those, those men who who provide the service. Um, so, so that will be be one limiting thing. Another limiting thing is that uh, if a number of these men uh, get sick, which is statistically likely then we don't have as much wiggle room in the health system actually so so this is a a, a bad time for more community outbreaks so i think that would be another reason to keep things tight in the community uh and until the uh the the foreign worker outbreak is is over and and the health system can uh, can get back some of its beds you spoke of hospital beds. I believe right now 3,500 COVID-19 uh, patients are hospitalised. That's a big strain on the public sector and the entire healthcare system, isn't it? Because I believe you only have about uh, 12,000 beds in acute hospitals in Singapore. Prof Fisher, how much of a strain on the healthcare system is it? Uh, and can Singapore cope if more patients need hospitalisation? Well, part of the strategy is to to decant a lot of the the well people in hospitals, you know, so so mild disease into the community isolation facilities, and you'll see over the next week um, many thousands of capacity uh, increased at at Expo, as you know, but also other facilities are, are are being made. So so that will give us back some of our hospital beds. Um, Yes, uh, the hospital systems are strained. There's no doubt about that. Not the least of which is many of the hospital workers are now providing service in the dormitories. Um, but and and as you know, for for some time, elective uh, hospital work has been cut, and now I think it's completely cut. cut whether it's uh, you know surgery or clinic appointments, anything that's that's elective has uh, has been postponed. Uh, but uh, there's been a heavy focus on maintaining essential services. So people who still need emergency care, uh, that, that's, that's not interfered with at the moment. Prof Leo, how is the NCID coping? You are seeing, I think, more uh, COVID-19 patients and you have maximised all your beds. You've uh, opened up more than uh, normal, isn't it? Well, you have heard from uh, YY as well as David. Uh, this is a, a huge challenge uh, with a big number. Uh, perhaps I should just uh, mention that uh, in any outbreak, we will learn uh, from the, the, the outbreak because no outbreak is the same. So certainly, you know, this outbreak is very, very different from SARS. Whatever we have put, uh, the, the strategies and preparedness for SARS, Obviously, this is uh, beyond that scale and a very different way of uh, disease uh, manifestations. So right now, we are seeing a huge number of relatively young, healthy foreign workers coming down with the disease. Uh, and I just want to stress that uh, no matter what uh, system we have put in place, the more important thing is that 
the entire system must be flexible uh, and be ready to uh, take on whatever challenge in whatever form and whatever shape. So that's exactly where we are right now. We have built um, NCID according to the scale and size uh, and the characteristic of SARS and quickly we realized that uh, that is not the case and uh, we have to now be flexible enough for us to be able to cope with the very different manifestations uh, that's basically young individuals um, that uh, we need to take care of them uh, at a slightly different kind of uh, clinical setup. And that's exactly the reason why we built up more accommodations at the different locations, have different medical teams uh, to take care of them. Uh, so, so coming back to this, this point, uh, because currently most of our COVID-19 cases are relatively young and therefore the level of care, the accommodations will be very different if one day the disease will then switch to older populations. And, and that's what we are most feared of because of the complications in the older individuals. So I would say that the system needs to be flexible, needs to be scalable to suit whatever situation that is going to come to allow us to be able to take on different size and different shape of the challenges. You know, you mentioned, uh, both you and Prof Bishop have mentioned that these are younger, healthier people. So uh, does it mean that the proportion of them who have uh, severe illness or who require intensive care is much lower than the general population? Prof Leo, could you give, for example, uh, the population, what's the percentage? And with the foreign workers, how is it different? Well, they are part of our general population. Uh, there is no difference in terms of the disease manifestations as well as the disease severity. But today we learn a lot in terms of the, uh, the, the severe outcome of the disease are mainly being bad, bear by the, uh, borne by the uh, older populations. So in other words, the older you are, the higher the chance of the individuals to get more severe disease and require high acuity care or even require ICU care. Uh, so there's no difference uh, in terms of uh, where you're coming from. They are all the same in the general populations. So what is more important right now, if you look at the, the foreign workers, is that we need to protect those workers that are much older. And that is the reason why we need to bring them into a very different setting, protect them from uh, being infected. And uh, should they be uh, infected with the conditions, the treatment will be exactly the same as in um, uh, local citizens or permanent residents uh, in Singapore. Right. Uh, Prof. Fisher, I noticed that uh, today there are just under 30 people in intensive care. Given the large number of infections in Singapore, this seems to be a bit lower than what you saw in Wuhan when you were there in January, proportionately. Do you know why this is so? Uh, well, it relates to the number of people that are infected. Um, so so uh, Wuhan was uh, was obviously tens of thousands, so, so we're not there yet. It's also the the stage of the illness. Uh, people get sick later in later in the illness. So, for instance, the the foreign workers. Uh, I'm going to be more concerned about them. You know, uh, and well, let's let's say we'll know more about how many are developing severe disease over the next week or three. Um, so, you know, obviously older people are more at risk of of getting severe disease, but younger people. Uh, can certainly get it, you know, e even above 30 uh, can get severe disease. It's just at a, at a much lower rate. Uh, I think uh, most of our uh, uh, cases uh, have actually had a fairly, uh, maybe YY I'll know, but, uh, or, or Yisin, the, the average age of our cases is, is, is quite low. Um, and maybe that explains why, it's, uh, why, why there's been a lower case fatality rate in Singapore. Right, so we'll all keep our fingers crossed on that. But uh, you also mentioned the strain on the healthcare system and the fact that non-urgent cases have been postponed. They've been postponed since January. How is that affecting patients with other diseases like cancer, for example, or heart failure? Uh, Prof Fisher, at the NUH, you know, do you have patients that are not getting the treatment they should get because they do not have COVID-19? Uh, at NUH, we kept uh, we kept elective work going uh, through January and and much of February uh, because we thought it would be better to get on with it uh, so so that if a restriction like this came along, at least we could have uh, 
not gotten too far behind. Uh, but but you know now, now I, I I think there is a um, a virtual total uh, stoppage of of all elective work. Um, one of the things that was made very clear by all levels of leadership was that cancer treatment wouldn't stop, uh, cardiac treatment wouldn't stop. Um, that th there's that defeats the purpose of of why we exist. So so you know things. You know, it's more elective surgery, uh, probably hernia repairs, maybe some some orthopedic work. Uh, these these types of things are clearly uh, are clearly being being saved for another day. But uh, but no, I think uh, the cancer clinics are still happening. They they a lot of them have gone virtual. Um, I think liver transplants are continuing, but less of them. Uh, kidney transplants, I think, have uh, have stopped because. Uh, that's also seen as elective, and and they can uh, they, they can survive with dialysis. So so it's been very selective what's what's been stopped, but but most certainly uh, critical work continues. Right. So patients who do really need care are getting the care they need. The rest will have to wait. So it's a matter of catch up once all this is over. How many of those patients you can deal with now? I think Prof Liu mentioned earlier that now we realise a lot of people are asymptomatic and uh, they are shedding the disease early. People are asking, should we be doing more tests, both virology and serology tests of the population to find out if we actually have large portions of the uh, population here already infected? Is this the correct time? Prof Tio, would you like to take that question? Certainly. So, I could just start off by explaining the two types of tests that Salma you have mentioned. There is the, the test which is what we are testing for these days to find out whether someone is actively infected with the virus and this looks for the presence of the virus in the body. That is the virology test that you're talking about. You mentioned the serology test. The serology test is actually testing for antibodies in the blood of people who have previously been infected. So if I have been infected with COVID-19, I have recovered from it, and after a certain amount of time, the body actually produces antibodies. This is to recognize the virus in the body to, with the assumption that it can try to fight it off. So serology tests are actually very useful to find out how many people in the population has already been exposed and infected with the virus and therefore in their body right now they carry this antibodies in their body the issue with serology tests that governments worldwide right now are grappling with including the world health organization is to what extent the presence of antibodies actually correlates with the infect uh, the immunity against reinfection so for some of the other viruses, which I believe uh, Dale and Yisi will be able to comment more, for some of the other viruses, the body actually recognizes this virus well enough that the antibodies present in the body, in my body, is able to fight off reinfections. So the next time, if I'm infected with COVID-19, I will actually not get the, the infection again because the antibody is able to fight it off. So when governments worldwide are starting to think about the strategy using serology tests, they are effectively trying to find out what is the fraction of the population right now that could be immune to the COVID-19 infection. But I have to emphasize there is a huge assumption here, which is the presence of antibodies actually correlates with immunity. Meaning if I have the antibodies in my, in my blood, I am immune to subsequent infection. This is something that right now the evidence doesn't support it yet. We need to learn a lot more. Prof Liu, uh, from what uh, Prof Tio just said, somebody who, get, who recovers from COVID-19 could get reinfected. Uh, is that something that most doctors hold with? There is not a lot of evidence and uh, this is still a very new virus and we are still learning from it. Um, I, I would say that uh, this reinfection part of it will need to be very clearly demonstrated 
so that we can understand uh, the disease behavior uh, better. Uh, but I just want to point out a few a few things. So first of all, it is uh, this is a, a virus that causes respiratory tract infections, and we do know that for respiratory virus infections, uh, many of the uh, infections that we we know in the past, the virus shedding or the ability to pick up the uh, the signal or fragment uh, of the genetic fragment of the virus may last for a long time. So this is what we call virus shedding, and the shedding can go on for, for weeks and for, for months. Now, this does not represent that this person is still actively having the infections. It just means that the body is trying to take over a period of time, clearing the virus from the respiratory system. So there is one possibility that uh, we are now seeing some of the cases uh, who had negative uh, PCR and subsequently turned positive. And the other explanation is that uh, for respiratory tract infections, it takes a while for the patients to fully recover. Uh, and some of the symptoms like uh, lung symptoms can, can, can be quite prolonged. For example, cough can be one of the last clinical symptoms to disappear from any of the uh, respiratory tract infection. So there are still a lot more that we need to learn. And uh, uh, I would say that uh, this is a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, many of the countries reported the uh, reversions from a negative PCR to become positive PCR, but we have not seen any of the countries that are able to produce the evidence that this is a viable virus that's being transmitted or being reactivated. And we have not seen enough of the, the evidence at this point in time suggesting that this is a new infections or reinfections. So there's still a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unknown out there uh, awaiting us for us to, to have better understanding and, and discovery. Now, coming back to the serology, uh, how do we use serology to estimate the uh, level of the um, protection in the individual as well as in the community is still an area that is under intense study, discussions, debate at this point in time. So effectively, in conclusion, we do not know how to use this tool effectively to give us a better understanding. So the, I think a lot more research need to go in into this area. Prof Fisher, would you like to add anything before we wrap up this session on uh, whether people get reinfected or whether it's time to do a test? Uh, no, I think uh, Yisin and uh, YY described it all very well. Right. In that case, thank you very much, all of you, for a very enlightening discussion. Uh, for all our viewers and readers out there, do keep abreast with the latest on the coronavirus in Singapore and around the world at straightstimes.com. And be sure to tune in to The Big Story at 5.30pm every weekday. I'm Salma Khalik. Goodbye and stay safe.